good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're so glad that you're here this morning. Would you stand with me? We'll draw your attention to the screen. We're going to sing together in times like these. These words are so applicable for us more now than ever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The next song on the screen, we usually would sing it for an invitation song. And it is a good invitation for you and me today as we get ready to go into communion service. We will sing the song, Just As I Am. Prayer for the Lord. Oh. 
please stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. And draw your attention to the screen, Psalm chapter number 9, verses 11 to 20. Let's read this together. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds among the people. When he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me, you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of all your praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk down in the pit which they made. In the net which they hid, their own foot is caught. The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Meditation, Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell in all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. May the Lord add the blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, and you may be seated. Well, we're glad you're here today on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. A few announcements we want to make this morning. I want to remind parents of our children that each Sunday morning at 8.30, the first service, we host our junior church, and they, they meet downstairs in our fellowship hall. And, of course, they'll be meeting after we dismiss uh, as soon as we finish our announcements. I uh, want to remind us that Monday through Friday, you think something different's going on? You look around when you came in this morning? Did you see a few things set up on the lawn? Yeah. Did you think we were all going to have a sleep out tonight? Yeah. Did you think maybe we were going to have service outside? Yeah, we thought about raising tents and having service outside, but I still think it may be a little cooler in here than out there. So we'll go with the cool. We want to be cool. Amen? All in favor of being cool? All right. So pray for our Vacation Bible School, Monday through Friday. Actually, it's Monday, Tuesday, break on Wednesday, and then Thursday and Friday from 9 o'clock until noon. And so we want to pray that the weather cooperates. We want to pray for the children that come. We want to keep everybody safe. We'll be safe. We'll be spaced. We'll be masked and yet still be able to have a vacation Bible school to the glory of God. And we're looking forward to that. And right now we have how many children signed up? Okay, so we got more today, last night or this morning. So we have 30 now. Okay, so we're up to 30 children, and uh, which we praise the Lord for that. We really do. And then with our leaders and staff working and helping out and, and bringing this all together, we just thank God for what he is doing for that. I do want to remind you that on Wednesdays at 7, you're going to have that break from the Vacation Bible School Wednesday. Come on out and join us here. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we're in the book of Colossians, and we're moving on. We were in the preeminency of Christ, and we are now moving into an area in the book that deals with the conversion of the Colossians. And I hope that you'll be able to be here for that. It's a real exciting time. All right, before we do anything else, you see this screen in front of me here? No, you're not going to see me on that screen. Thank the Lord for that. You get to see me in person. Amen? Some of you said amen. All right. Uh, I thought I was amongst friends. Maybe not. Okay. So what we're going to do is every year before Vacation Bible School starts, the Sunday prior, we do our little penny march. And you've always been generous. You've always blessed us and helped us in doing this because it gives us this little boost coming into Monday. Okay? So now is, is we're going to play some music. That's what this is all about. My wife will get this set up in just a moment. And as she does, we just want to remind you that if you have pennies, change, contributions, and as we said before, you can have pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, 50 cent pieces, dollar pieces, dollar bills, $5 bill, $10 bill, $20 bill, $50 bill, $100 bill, $1,000 bill, anything you want to put in a bucket. I guarantee you, you put a $1,000 bill in that bucket, that bucket's going to whoop. 
just like that. You say it's a bill, we'll make it go, whoop, just like that, okay? So we're gonna start the music. Now, as long as you keep your mask on and you come up, you can just come and dump into the pail, okay? Let's go with our music and we are ready. Right there, go ahead, we're all set. Okay, folks, if you had something you wanna contribute, please do. Actuality, right? One team is God loves the world, the other team is God loves you. So that means God loves us all. Amen? Amen. And so we so appreciate that. At this time, anybody for Junior Church? Yes, Mrs. Sargent? Can make their way to? Downstairs. Downstairs. All right, Fellowship Hall, there you go.
you got to love technology when it works for you, right? All right. Well, at this time, let's pray, and then we're going to observe the Lord's table. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And thank you for this opportunity we can come to the house of the Lord today to sing, to praise you, to worship your holy name. Father, we do thank you, and we are so appreciative how you have brought people in this place together for our upcoming vacation Bible school. Father, in the midst of everything that we're going through in the health front today, we certainly wanted to be able to have something for the children and yet keep everybody safe, children and leaders alike. And so, God, we commit it to you. We commit our lives to you this week in the doing of Vacation Bible School. And Father, as we set up tents yesterday, last night, and with folks that came in the prayer meeting we had last night on the front lawn, as it was prayed out there that we trust that boys and girls who do not know Jesus as their Savior would come to know him in a personal way. And for those boys and girls who know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give them peace and you would give them strength. You would give them the courage to live the Christian life in their young lives. Father, thank you for our offering this morning. Thank you for blessing us, Lord, and taking care and meeting our needs. Father, I pray that you bless those, each one who gives, Father, out of obedient hearts to you, recognizing that all that we have is yours, and you've entrusted us as managers, as stewards, to take care of those things that you've given to us, and we give a part back to you. Father, as we open the scriptures, we go into our time of communion, just as we sang our song, just as I am without one plea. Father, prepare our hearts now. And might we reverently, respectfully, obediently, humbly come before your throne as we remember. And we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And beginning in verse number 23. For I receive from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took the bread and when he gave thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me. Brother John Chase would you give thanks please. They took the bread and they did eat.
In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Brother Bernie, would you pray for this, please? They took the cup and they did so. Blessed be he the tie that binds our hearts in. Take your Bible with me, if you would, and we're going to turn to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter. First Peter chapter number 2. First Peter chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 11. 1 Peter chapter 2. And verse number 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Father, meet with us now in these next few moments around your word. Again, thank you for the opportunity we have to be here today. Speak to us from this passage. Fill each of us with Holy Spirit power. Use me and I pray for your filling upon myself. God, that you'd help us to speak as you would have us to bless us this day. If there are any here that do not know Christ, Lord, let them come to know him in a personal way. And for each of us who name the name of Christ, Lord, might we take to heart the lesson that we find that Peter shares with those who are scattered abroad in their time of suffering, persecution, and trial. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter had a tender love for the Christians. He had a tender love for the believers here that were scattered abroad, as we mentioned to you in the past. Notice how he addresses the hearers of this passage. Look at verse number 11 with me. The very first word in the passage, beloved. Beloved. You know, we too need this kind of love between believers today. Amen? I mean, just think about it. 
Oh, I realize that there are different denominations and I realize that there are different church meetings and all of this about the world and we're not standing here. I don't have an ecumenical bone in my body and that might upset some and that's okay. But I do believe that all true believers in Jesus Christ, all who name the name of Christ, all who have trusted him as savior of their lives, Folks, we need to have a love between believers today. You know, I remember when I first came to Swansea, and, and uh, we have our little church here, and I remember we had a, there was a huge church on one side of town and a huge church on the other side of town, and it just seemed like everything we tried to do just stayed a constant, hmm, you know, it just, and one day I just got so down and so depressed. I'm like, how in the world can we compete? Wrong word. But I thought, how in the world can we compete? We had larger churches here, larger churches across the bay. What do we have to offer? And I remember I was reading the Bible, and God just simply said to me through the pages of Scripture, no, it wasn't an audible voice. No, I wasn't walking outside, and a 900-foot Jesus appeared in front of me. None of that happened. But as I was reading the Bible, all of a sudden it was like the Holy Spirit grabbed a hold of my heart and said, you know what? Just preach the word just preach the word. And he said, don't worry about competing. You know, this isn't competition. We are all on the same team. And he said, there are some people who come to your church that wouldn't go to another. And some people go to another church that won't come to your church. He said, just preach the word. And I look at this and I think about Peter and I think about Peter's life. I think about the lives of the apostles and who they were able to reach out to and the ministries that they were able to carry on in the Lord. But the thing that just resonates to me as we go through the book of 1 Peter, as we go through the book of 2 Peter, Peter's love for the brethren. Now remember, I'm going to take you right back. Father's Day, when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him, spoke with him, and said that Satan has desired to do what? To sift you as wheat. But then Jesus said, but I have prayed for you that your faith fail not, and that when you return to me, what did he tell them to do? Strengthen the brethren. Strengthen your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I guarantee you that part of that strengthening we are to have with one another starts with the love that we have for each other in Christ Jesus. So let's keep that in mind. Peter had a common ground. He had a common ground with these who were scattered abroad. They were going through times of suffering. Peter had common ground. He understood what suffering was about. He knew what suffering for Christ was all about. He knew that the world was at, with, at odds with those who were living, seeking to live for Jesus Christ then. Listen, the world is at odds with those who try to live for Jesus Christ today. We see that over and over again. We see it around the world. We see it even here in our own nation now. So with all that in mind, message today is this. How do we, how do you, how do I, how do all of us as this part of the body of Christ, how do we live upstanding lives in the Christian life? How do we do that? Is it possible to live an upstanding life for the Christian life today? Is it possible to live a righteous and true life for Almighty God today? Three things I want to give to you this morning, and they're all C's, so they'll be easier to remember, okay? The first one is found in verse number 11. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against your soul. First C, be clean. Is be clean. What does he say to us? He says to abstain. Literally, this word abstain here means to hold away from one's person. To hold it away from one's person. To not get involved in it. To not take part with it. To not embrace it. Now, why would he say that? Listen, this is a war in which all of us as believers find ourselves today. Would you not say that at times there are struggles physically that people go through? Even the Christian life? 
There are wars materially that people go through. There's the physical plane we find ourselves dealing with. There's the, mirror, the material plane we find ourselves dealing with. But I'm going to tell you this morning, beloved, the main fight that you and I deal with every day is found on the spiritual plane. Every single day. You say, well, I'm not so sure about that. Let's take one of the great Bible characters in the New Testament. His name was Paul. And the Apostle Paul was used by God to pen, what, something like 13 letters in the New Testament? We read from a letter this morning, taking up communion, that he wrote to the church at Corinth. God, through inspiration, used Paul to pen these words down. And what does Paul say? Paul says, but the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Did that ever happen to you? That's the battle of the spiritual plane. We're all on that. In Christ, we are new creations. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But as we've said it so many times and lock it into your mind and your heart, your old nature didn't move out of your tabernacle, your earthly tent. It just moved over. And your new nature moved in, so there's the struggle that's going on. Peter knew this. It says this struggle's as old as sin. This struggle is as up to date as today's temptations. As Christ followers, we need to distance ourselves from our own self indulgent urges that would seek to minimize the spiritual while at the same time trying to maximize the temporal. And folks, we all have to be careful of that. We all have to watch that. And, and so Peter starts out here. I beg you, he says, strong word. I beg you as sojourners, I beg you as pilgrims that you abstain from fleshly lust. There are several battlegrounds in which this war, this battle that takes place in our lives, several battlegrounds in which this battle takes place. There is the battlefield called the lust of the flesh. That's a battlefield. Now, the lust of the flesh has to do with the desires for sinful, sensual pleasure. What you hear, what you see, what you touch, what you think, that's a battlefield. And that's a battlefield for every single one of us, male and female alike. There is the battlefield called the lust of the eyes. That's a battlefield. That battlefield deal, deals with covetousness. Oh, I like what they have. I want it. Materialism. They have two. I have none. I want one. And then sometimes we get the one and we say, I only have one. I need ten. That's the battlefield. There is the battlefield called the pride of life. We can all be afflicted by this battlefield. Being proud about our position in the world, in the workplace, no matter where we are. Who is he? Oh, he's the patriarch of the family. Wow. Who is she? She's the matriarch of the family. Ooh. We all do that. What do you do for work? You, want, you know, it's funny. You see guys get together in a circle. They start talking. And all of a sudden, one guy says, what do you do for work? Well, all of a sudden, the hands go in the pocket. The chest boom, comes out. The gut goes in. The chest comes out. And they're like bulls, you know. Just, oh, I do this. Right. Position. Position. Now, we should all have a sense of pride of what we do for the Lord and accomplishing in the work he has us in. But be careful about this thing called the pride of life. Where do you get this from anyway? Well, in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, the Bible says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a huge statement, by the way. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, here we go, the lust of the flesh or the desires for sinful, sensual pleasure, the lust of the eyes 
or covetousness given over to materialism and the pride of life, being proud of your position in this world, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So how does John start this out? John, one of the fellow apostles with Peter. How does John start this out? He says, do not love the world. Can we put that in modern day vernacular for you and for me? You ready? He simply says this, stop loving the world. And he's writing this to believers. Does that shock you? You would think he's saying stop loving the world just to the unbelievers out in the world. You know what? You're, you're doing wrong. You need to stop loving this thing. No, he's turned his gaze on believers and he's telling believers as we're looking at you today as believers and into my own heart, he's saying we need to stop loving the world. Stop acting in a way that is inconsistent with your relationship to Jesus Christ. And we do that. We do that. Stop befriending a morally evil system that is opposed to all that God is and holds dear. Remember, you say, well, a morally evil system. You're, you're talking about the world in which we live. Yeah. And James said, to be a friend of the world is to be an enemy of God. And the world he's talking about is that morally evil, corrupt, anti-Christian attitude that permeates the world today. That God says as a Christian, there's no part of that for you. Stop loving it. Stop embracing it. Stop taking it into your life because it's not for you. There have been many casualties in this battle on each of these battlefields. Some examples of those who lost on these battlefields. Samson succumbed to the deceit of Delilah. Remember that in Judges 16? Oh, Sam, tell, tell me your strength. Tell me your strength. And what, he told her so many different things, and, and it didn't come true, and he's still mighty and powerful, and, and, and she keeps after him. You know, basically, if you love me, you'll tell me. And finally, he does. And she set it up, and the enemy comes to attack him, and he goes to use his strength to fight off the enemy. And the Bible said he didn't know that his strength from the Lord was gone. He succumbed. He lost the battle on that battlefield. David succumbed while on his roof watching Bathsheba bathe in 2 Samuel chapter number 11. God made a woman to look beautiful to a man. Guys, aren't you glad about that? Man, I am. I, 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 I would have had a hard time if I met Connie and I said, Hi, how are you? And she's like, Whoa, have a nice day. But she was feminine and she batted her eyes and, and, and she was sweet. You win, you, you attract more what with honey than you do vinegar, right? You attract more with the honey. But it has its place, doesn't it? What does God say? And yet David, he was in a place he shouldn't have been looking at what he should not have been looking at. And he lost that battle on that battlefield. It led to an adultery. It led to a child that was lost. It led to a murder of Bathsheba's husband. There's another. Peter succumbed. It's interesting that he's writing these letters. As I said, he knew. He experienced. He succumbed when he made a decision to follow the Lord afar off. Do you remember when even he was warming himself at a fire after, after denials and all this other stuff or, or things that had happened and, and he's warming himself by a fire and somebody comes up and says, hey, hey you, you speak like them. In fact, you're one of them that follow after Jesus. And he said, no, not me. I don't even know him. His great denial in Luke chapter 22 and the list goes on, the examples of those in the Bible that God has penned for us 
allowed us to see years later of those who lost on the battlefield. But you know, I'm so grateful that there are also examples of those who experienced victories on these battlefields. Joseph refused to yield to the advances of Mrs. Potiphar, or Mr. Potiphar's wife. Remember that? In Genesis chapter 39, Joseph was a young man. He was brought there into Egypt in that country. And he, you know, all the stages out that God took him through. And he ends up living in Potiphar's house. And every day, Mrs. Potiphar made advances on him, made advances on him. And finally, that last day, she basically says, hey, come lie with me. And he says, no. And he goes running out the door. And she's got a hold of his garment. And it rips off him as he flies out the door. And then when her husband came home, she told a different story. Joseph fled. He refused to yield to the advances of Mr. Potiphar's wife. Daniel chapter 3, the three Hebrew young people, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refused to defile themselves with the king's meat and wine. You don't drink of my wine. You don't eat of my meat when this music plays. You don't do these things. You're going into a fiery furnace. They basically said, if that's the way it's got to be, We'll trust God to take care of us. And God brought into them a wonderful victory. I want you to see something here. We don't have the uh, opportunity to get in all these passages, but I want you to turn with me at this one to Acts chapter number 7, if you will. Acts chapter 7. I want you to see this. Maybe this is something we might relate to a little bit more here. So that's why we want to turn to it today. It's about a deacon, a godly deacon. His name is Stephen. It's a man who, he's a man who refused to compromise his preaching. And in refusing to compromise his preaching, his refusing to stop preaching, his refusing to water down the preaching, his refusing to stop sharing the word of God, we see him being stoned in the process of this. But in Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 51, if you're in Acts 7, look at verse 51. Stephen's speaking, and he says to these people around him, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as, did your, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold of the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. And when these heard these things, now this is just a portion of the message that Stephen's bringing to them, but when they heard these things, the Bible says they were cut to the heart. Again, they're furious at what he said. And they gnashed at him with their teeth, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, who would later come to faith and become known as the Apostle Paul, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he died. Here's one you say, well, this, this is an example of victory. It is. It's an example of victory concerning a man who refused to water down a preaching, who refused to compromise on the preaching. And in fact, when you think of the Lord Jesus in heaven today, the Bible tells us Jesus sits at the right hand of the heaven throne today, today, making intercession for you and me, correct? Yes? yes? Did you notice in this passage the physical posture of the Lord Jesus when this is going on? Did you read it? Jesus was standing. It was as if Jesus, there's two thoughts here. It was as if Jesus was giving his man of God, Stephen Deacon, a standing ovation 
for his uncompromising position. He was also standing, they say there's a, there's a field of thought here, that he was standing, knowing, looking, taking word of each one because a judgment time would be coming. But what does Stephen do? He refuses to compromise and he's stoned to death. How is his victory? It's always a victory when they're absent from the body and present with the Lord. Amen? Think about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, in these battlefields that we're all involved in, God has made a provision for us to win every time if you want it. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the Bible says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. It's common to all of us. These battlefields are common to everybody. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you, me, each of us in Christ may be able to bear it. Amen? First thing, upstanding Christian life, be clean. Be clean. Get in the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit encourage your heart and your life. Second, be careful. Be careful. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 12, part of our text that we read this morning, Peter says, speaking of us, having your conduct honorable among Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, when they slander you, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Interesting word here, observe. It's only used two times, I recollect, in the, in this, in the New Testament here. And one is here. The other one is talking about a wife living her life before an unsaved husband or a husband that's away from the Lord. The word observed here means which they, that they may see, they may by your good works observe, or this is a, a conscious, ongoing examination, that through the conscious, ongoing examination, they may glorify God in the day of visitation. So what does that say? What is Peter saying to us? There are many spectators in this war. There are many spectators in this war. There are those who are watching you as a Christian. There are those who are watching you to see if your faith is real. They listen to what you say. They watch what you do. You didn't sign up for that. You didn't sign up, okay, God, I want people to watch, watch me 24-7. God, I want people to listen to what I say. God, I want people to watch what I do. No, that just comes with the territory. They're watching you. They're watching to see if your faith is real. Number one, if your faith is real to you. Because if your faith is real to you, you're going to live it out. You're going to be careful about what you see, what you say, what you do, where you go. One of the reasons, I, you know, I'm, I'm really not a big, one fella calls it fake book. I'm not a real big fake book fan. Facebook, as it's called, when it started out, it really started out, it was almost like a, a dating thing. Somebody go on Facebook and say, oh, I'm hoping to find this person I want to date. I'm hoping to find him I'd like to date. And there was just some basic, you know, how are you or doing this? To... And now it's, 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 it's all over the map with everything. But I, I, I don't care for that because sometimes... You, you see people, you talk to people, and, and, and people talk one way, but when they're on Facebook, they act another way. And that, and that goes out all over. 
Had a hard day today. Oh, I need a Seagram's. Really? You were just telling me yesterday that God was your all in all. Not judging. I, I can't judge. I got my own stuff. And so do you. But you know what we're taught in Scripture? Listen, we need to be careful. We need to be clean. We need to live a life that's consistent to our testimony of Jesus. And we need to be careful for the same reason. There are spectators in this war, those that watch to see if your faith is real, if it's real to you, if it's real to your family, if it's real to others. And then there are those hoping that you might fall or that you might be defeated in some way so they can criticize you. But there are those there that do that too. Oh, oh, I knew it wasn't real because look at what they did. And sometimes I think we have to be careful with that, don't we? The old saying is, by the grace of God, there go I, right? Be careful, be careful. Live within this. Ask God to help you with this before you start helping everybody else. And if somebody comes to you and says, listen, I need to be accountable, I need to pray, I've got junk going on in my life and I need you to help me, shame on you. If they come to you that way and you begin to share their luggage and their baggage with other people, that's not accountability. That's not even love. If somebody, if a brother or sister comes to you and says, I've got a problem and I need prayer and I need help, and they take it upon themselves, listen, they become transparent enough to lean upon you, to lean into you, to share their heart with you, shame on you if you make it public knowledge on Facebook or tweet it or Twitter it, or email it, or, hey, by the way, psst, hey, but psst, and I just want to tell you something. On the, on, the, on the QT, I'm going to tell you something. Be careful. I think it was Teddy Roosevelt, when he was with the Rough Riders, he had a man in his group that he admired, and this man could get any job done. And this man said, I can, go, I can go get that thing for you. He said, how are you going to get it? He said, I can sneak in. I'm just going to steal it. I can get it for you. Roosevelt backed up and said, you're no longer with me. The fellow looked at him and said, what do you mean? He said, I've learned that a fellow that will steal for me is the same fellow that will steal from me. Don't come around here anymore. God, raise up more people like that. All right? I'm saying to you two words. Be careful. And especially in the household of faith, listen, especially amongst believers, I can't stress it enough. If somebody says, can I share something with you? Be careful. Be careful. It does not become broadcast news. Why must we be careful? Why must we be careful? Because we represent the world. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. Let me give you this real quick, and then we're just going to wrap it all up here. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We have been called by God to serve as ambassadors in the world. And that starts in our home and goes out our front door, to the workplace, to the school, wherever we go. We have been called to serve him as ambassadors, even in a world that is in rebellion against him. We've still been called to serve. We represent his message of peace and reconciliation. That's what we're all about. Secondly, we are to shine as light in a dark place. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, the Bible said that you may become blameless and harmless, the children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. We're to be light bearers. That's what the passage says. 
And we're not only to be light bearers, but we're to be blameless in our actions and our attitudes. That's what that passage says. And we're to be without blemish in and out of the church. That's what the passage says. And we are to be reflectors of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the passage says. And then our light. Our light is meant to glorify our Father in heaven, according to Matthew 5.16. Is it not? It says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So be clean. Be careful. And then finally, and we're done, be consistent. He says here in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, Therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Peter calls for more than Sunday morning Christianity. We always look our best on Sunday morning, don't we? We come to church, we got smiles on underneath our masks, I hope. We have our Bibles, our pens ready, we're going to take notes, we do all this Sunday morning. And then Monday comes along, and what do we do? We still live the same way? We're supposed to. We still speak the same way as we did on Sunday in church? When we're out of the church, we're supposed to. We still encourage people outside for Christ? We're supposed to. So Peter calls for more than Sunday Christianity. The Christian life, he shares with us, encompasses every area of life. Listen, the same way you act in church... Smiling, waving, listening, note-taking, whatever you do. It's the same way we act at the gas pump. The same way we act at the market. The same way we act out of doors here, right? And as such, he even goes into this, we are to submit voluntarily to governing authorities, not as a matter of choice or personal conviction, but by obligation to all civil authorities and rules we encounter. Stop sign at the end of the road. Don't blow through it. That's a rule. Stop at a stop sign. Green light means go. Yellow light, caution. Yielding. Red light, stop. Governing, governing authorities. God has placed them in a position to watch over us and to protect us and to judge and take care of the evil and the bad. You say, what about when they say, like what's going on in some places, you can't worship God this way. That puts it in a different light according to what we read about Peter and John when they say we ought to obey God rather than men. We get that. But that's not what Peter's alluding to right here. Not as I read this passage. We are to submit voluntarily to governing authorities. I don't know why it is. I've talked to people. Sometimes all people want to do is fight. Well, the government said, look left. I want, to want, I want to look right. Fight. Right? Well, wait a minute. Are they telling you you can't worship God? Are they telling you you can't preach in church? Are they telling you you can't? There are some things they're starting to say, and some people are getting religion. They're getting Christian representation to take care of that. And they haven't done that to us yet. So what do we do? Well, we pray and we seek the face of God. But what I'm saying is, every listen, how many of you people drive a car? How many folks drive a car? Okay, if I, if I say pull out your billfold, do you have anything that would demonstrate to me that you have that right to drive a car? It's called a license. Who gave it to you? A governing authority. So if you say, I don't believe a governing authority should give me a license, and guess what? You're doing this <laughs> everywhere you go. Okay, so you, you have to put it in the right mindset. All right? Con he's consistently the stop sign, your license that you have. I don't like paying taxes any more than you do, but we get services from our towns and communities, and our taxes help to do that. If you have somebody that's levying out more taxes, then you go to the voting booth. Okay, I want somebody that's not going to do as much of that, right? Put them in office, right? 
There are ways. It's consistency. And mark it down. If the government would step in and say, no more church here. This has got to be leveled. This has got to be torn. There'd be consistency about that too. We got to obey God rather than man. Consistently. And he says in verse 15, why do we do this? For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. You see that? Philippians 3.20 reminds us, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have the unique privilege of being citizens of heaven, but we also are citizens of earth, And being citizens of earth, we are called to be different. To be different. As we said last week, we are a special people. Some versions say we are God's peculiar people. But we are called to be different, living above reproach with the desire to impact our world for Jesus Christ. And that's what Peter talks about here. Let me share this with you and we're done. Scientists now say that a series of slits, not a huge giant gash, sank the Titanic. The opulent 900-foot cruise ship sank in 1912 on its very first maiden voyage. That voyage was being made from England to New York. 1,500 people died in the worst maritime disaster of the time. The most widely held theory was that the ship hit an iceberg which opened a huge gash in the side of the liner. But an international team of divers and scientists use sound waves to probe the wreckage that's buried in the mud under two and a half miles of water. Their discovery? The damage was surprisingly small. Instead of the huge gash, they found six relatively narrow slits across the six watertight holes. Their conclusion, that is what sunk Titanic. Why do I share that? Small damage, invisible to most, can sink not only a great ship, but a great reputation for Christ. Peter's encouraging us, be clean. Be clean. Very, very important for you and for me. He's encouraging us, be careful. We are being encouraged, be consistent. It is this same Peter who will write later on, the devil, your adversary, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And if you think that doesn't mean you, then he's already got you. So be careful. Live the upstanding Christian life. Does it mean you won't fall? Does it mean you won't skin your knees? Does it mean you won't do something stupid? that can harm your testimony. That's why we need to be clean. That's why we need to be careful. That's why we need to be consistent. Jesus saved you, amen? Amen. And he wants to use you for his honor and his glory. So let's allow him to. And let's follow after Peter's encouragement to our lives today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to be here today. God, for each one that's come, I ask your blessing be upon them. Maybe there's somebody here this morning to say, Preacher, I've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. But I'd like to. 
I've heard you speak about it many times. And I wasn't ready. But I am now. I'd like to turn from my sin and turn to the Lord Jesus. I want to know that when this body dies, when this body dies, the one that's really me that God created will be in heaven with him for all eternity. Say, preacher, would you pray for me? Anybody like that this morning? Just slip your hand up, put it down. Anybody like that? You like that here? Anybody? Christian? I know at one time in your life, if not more, you've probably heard a message similar to this before. But I often think of those messages that we hear again and again. We need them. We need to be encouraged. We need to be clean by the washing of the word. And so with that in mind, examine your own heart. Check your own life. And if there's something in your life that shouldn't be, come to God and say, God, forgive me. Jesus, I put it under the blood. Jesus, help me to live the victorious Christian life in you once again. And you can overcome that battle on that battlefield. So let's look to him together as we pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the importance of what we're taught today. I can't help but think when I read about the return of Jesus when he says, when I come back, will I find faith? Oh God, help us to be found faithful until you call us home, until you come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and have a wonderful week in the Lord. And remember, pray for VBS. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.